I'm delighted to be in this, this anthology. Uh, I had an interesting altercation with Dee Gilmore today <laughs> because uh, I showed him this book called Works and it had a poem in it. He said, this poem should have been in this anthology and I said it was not, but he thought it's so Southern and so queer. So he said, why don't you read it at this reading? So I'm gonna start off reading a, book, a poem that's not in the book, but it's a poem I love a lot. And um, anyway, it's called Penis to Nipple. Oh, I must tell you that a, a boyfriend of mine for my birthday memorized this poem and read it and gave it to me through memory. And I thought, what a gorgeous birthday present this was. <laughs> penis to nipple. Touch your penis to my nipple like a serpent sucking a pear for sweetness, like leather wrapped around the palm of a hand, like the mouth open, beseeching pleasure, finding rain to quench headaches. Lie with me on the sheath of heaven, out in the fields beyond, before the oceans, tumbling off cliffs into the sky, sudden escape from brevity of expectation, aloneness and desolation like a railroad leaving hell. You are the cock of thunder, I a ripped pouch of wheat sprinkled before your feet and ankles. The teeth are delighted by your tit, your pectoral stash of honey, by your sweat and bone. We are two lonely cowboys. The suburban imagination has been buggered worse by our leaving together. You are a horse, I a silver burr in your balls. So thank you, Dee. So I'm going to read a, a little snippet from uh, my piece here, which is called An Indelible Mark. And I talk about how being from the South is an indelible mark. And I talk about my growing up as a very much a gay Southern Jew. Uh, strangely enough, growing up Southern Jewish and very much queer, certainly quietly sissified, questioning things had become a part of my own secret wardrobe since I was a child. I was abetted in this by my father, Lewis, in the strange, contradictory, even romantic way he lived his life. He was born in 1916 in Charleston, South Carolina, an only child of two prosperous Lithuanian Jews. And even though very spoiled, he had been brought up as a little Southern gentleman in dark velvet shorts and white silk shirts. Both of my paternal grandparents died before I was five, but Lewis liked to talk about them. His mother was a cosmopolitan woman who spoke French, Yiddish, Russian, and of course English. A marvelous cook, she presided over a genteel Jewish home that in the presence of black servants makes kosher laws with southern politeness. My father's nickname was Bebe, Yiddish for baby. He was headstrong, quick-tempered, and almost shockingly rebellious. He hated working for other people and loved taking time out to be on his own. He had that distinct presence, masculine, strong-smelling, and handsome, that many Southern men of his generation had. I remember his smell, camel cigarettes, sharp, salty perspiration, and a dash of the Menon deodorant just coming in. Like a lot of Jewish men, he went off to fight in World War II. When he came back, I had a feeling he was very changed. He just couldn't be a nice Jewish boy anymore. Energetic, affable, talkative, he brought back with him a lot of Gentile army buddies and regularly went out drinking with them. Although he admired Yiddishkeit, that is Jewish culture, he was crazy about guns, hunting, and fishing, and frequently met with his buddies to kill and eat flesh Jews would object to like squirrel, rabbit, or deer. These ventures horrified my mother. She couldn't understand why Bebby just couldn't be a regular enough Jew while he told me how important it was to accept people for what they were, but still question their actions if they weren't good. He put this into practice by making me feel always accepted by him, even though we had little in common. I hated killing anything, found fishing boring, and loved art and puppets. Strangely, my mother hated that I loved puppets. She referred to them as Perry's dolls in front of other people, humiliating me. My father, though, who adored fantasy, adventure, and the very southern art of storytelling, and uh, it's the very southern art of storytelling, made me a puppet stage and helped me make hand puppets and marionettes. I was scared of his guns and bloodshed of any sort, but we bonded over this so that the most beautiful parts of my childhood were spent working on puppets together. He would say about these times, let's make an adventure out of this, just the two of us. The genuine intimacy of this seemed very Southern to me. 
that it was important to like people genuinely and not simply use them. But if you didn't like them, not to be hypocritical about it. I have a feeling this attitude destroyed him in business and might have led to why he died in complete poverty, what would be a shameful circumstance, as anything involving money in the South at that time was, which colored my entire growing up. The good thing, though, and I learned that every bad thing had to have one, was that I learned to question everything, even if I kept my answers that I got, that any answers I got to only to myself. I questioned why black people were routinely treated like subhumans, something that embarrassed many Southern Jews since the Nazis had treated Jews the same way. I questioned there were things boys should do and girls should do, and the two should never meet. And I questioned why I felt so alone, so isolated as a kid from the other youngsters in the housing project where I grew up after Bebby died, even though I couldn't put a name on why. But I knew there was something there. What I wanted was someone to share the things with me, these things, someone to reach into that loneliness and to attach himself to me. And I knew it had to be a boy, even if I could barely speak it passionately, romantically, as you could only do in Savannah, Georgia, because the city, and I knew this, was so romantic in itself. Thank you. I enjoyed reading before you.